with the with the conversation between uh, Dr. Marvin Delaney and Ms. Zimmer Rogers. Uh, we also have here uh, Larry Ellums. I'll, I'll just go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Larry Ellums from the da uh, Dallas Institute of Humanities. He has been instrumental in bringing about many festivals and many authors uh, to Dallas. So it's an honor to have him here to introduce Ms. Zimmer Rogers. Do you want to go ahead and start, yes, Sandra? Yes, we're ready. Wonderful. Okay, so here we go. It's just, it, it, it's such a great pleasure to be here and welcome everyone to this Sunday noon session of the inaugural Dallas Literary Festival, honoring Emma Rogers, featuring Ms. Emma Rogers in conversation with Dr. Marvin Dulaney. It's my honor to introduce our guest speakers, but first I want to note with deepest appreciation the work of Sandria Smith and her team in producing this grand event, which I hope will be with us for many years to come. And your success, Sandria, means that you'll probably have to do it again. So I, I hope so. If introductions came with titles, this one might be called The Legend of Emma Rogers. Her accomplishments over many decades have established her far-reaching fame and have also changed Dallas enormously for the better in both visible and invisible ways. She is perhaps best known in Dallas and North Texas for founding and co-owning with Ashira Oya Tosiwe Black Images Book Bazaar, which was the brainchild of Ms. Rogers and operated for some 30 years in South Dallas starting in 1977. It became a destination for loyal customers and a frequent stop for major African-American figures such as Maya Angelou, Terry McMillan, and Derek Bell. I have time to mention only a few of her many achievements that have collectively made a profound difference. I hope they will give a sense of her universal and varied interest. She is co-founder and curator of the Dallas Civil Rights Museum, housed in the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center. She serves as chair of the board of directors of the Bishop Arts Theater Center. In the political arena, she was commissioner with the City Plan Commission 2007 to 15. She was chair of the centennial celebration of Richard Wright in Dallas in 2008. And over the years, she has served on many literary committees such as Darts, Poetry in Motion, the Tullisoma South Dallas Book Fair, and the Mayor's Children's Book Fair. Her numerous honors include being named Community Hero in D Magazine's Special Heroes Best of Big D edition in 2020. She was Volunteer of the Year in 2020, which award was given to her at the 38th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Gala. The Sojourner Truth Meritorious Service Award she was given in 2017 from the North Texas League of the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs. I'm gonna stop there and above all, maybe it could be said simply that Emma Rogers loves books, a love that began in her childhood and continues to this day when she is reading, listening to and leading book discussions on Isabel Wilkerson's best-selling book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Ms. Rogers will be in conversation today with Dr. W. Marvin Dulaney, who occupies his own distinguished place in the life of our city. He is Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of the African American Museum of Dallas, where his duties include supervising ongoing operations at the venerable and highly regarded museum created in 1974 by founding Director and President, Dr. Harry Robinson, Jr. Dr. Dulaney is former chair of the University of Texas at Arlington's History Department and former 14-year executive director of the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture in Charleston, South Carolina. Named in his honor is the W. Marvin Dulaney Dallas-Fort Worth Branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, a local branch that Dr. Dulaney founded. He earned his Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in American and African-American history 
from the Ohio State University after graduating magna cum laude in history at Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. He has served on local boards and written numerous reviews and articles for scholarly journals. He is editor of several publications, including From Education and Civil Rights to Preserving the African-American Experience, co-editor of the book Essays on the American Civil Rights Movement, and author of Black Police in America, published by Indiana University Press. In addition, he has served on the boards of several distinguished organizations and received numerous awards for his community service, activism, and scholarship. It's an honor to have you both here. And Dr. Delaney, I give over the program to you and Ms. Emma Rogers. All right. Let me say that uh, this is a, really an honor to be uh, interviewing and talking books and history and personal life with uh, Emma Rogers. Um, I was looking at my books uh, over the past few years and uh, about a quarter of the 700 books or so that I have, have the label, the sticker, Black the little gold sticker. Book Bazaar. Yeah, I still have the, those little gold stickers you used to do, Emma. In fact, I, I've known Emma for about 40 years. We met in 1982. You see how my, my, my memory's still with me. Uh, you know, it's been 40 years. Uh, we met at TCU at Texas Christian University. Oh, yeah. You brought over some books to sell on campus during one of the uh, university's lectures. So uh, again, Emma, this is a, a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Of course, um, you know, you always distinguish me, or I felt distinguished, because um, when you were doing that early book review in the 80s, we, we read The Color Purple, for example, mm -hmm. and I, I was only male, <laughs> right. I guess brave enough to be a part of the, the group talking about that particular book, as well as some of the others. Anyway, Emma, uh, why don't we start? Well, Mark, I want to say, and I recall that you were responsible for writing the review questions for one of those book club discussions, That's and right. you dropped it by my house about five o'clock in the morning on your way back to work on your PhD, so you were really committed. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I do remember that, yes. All right, uh, let's start by talking about you, Emma. Um, you know, where you're from and how you got into reading Black literature as much as you have and being sort of like the, the courier of Black <laughs> literature and the Black experience in Dallas and throughout Texas. Well, my I, I was born in Niagara Falls, New York, and I was the third generation there. My grandfather, who was born in 1879, brother had to leave Texas because he got into it with a white person. I don't know what the incident was. Mm -hmm. So I was born there and raised there. And what we would do for Juneteenth, you know, Texans always celebrate Juneteenth no matter where they live. We would go to St. Catharines in Ontario, Canada to observe Juneteenth. And St. Catharines was significant because Harriet Tubman, when she would escape, that was one place she went. And then she would go back there and, and there was a community that developed there. So just keeping that tradition of Juneteenth. And then I moved to Texas when I was 10 and got to experience Jim Crow. And I'll never forget, we were in Sears and Roebuck at the time and I wanted to get some water. And so there was a water fountain. I ran over there to get the water. And uh, my mother said, no, 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 no. But I went on and got, you know, a child. I ran on and got the, drank the water. And the saleswoman looked at my mother, but it was a white water fountain. And I didn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. So um, just that whole, whole, whole experience of, you know, being involved with uh, experiencing Jim Crow. And then in Texas, um, well, and I moved here just as I was getting ready to enter the fifth grade. And I went to elementary school. And my first black teacher was Ruby Carbon. And the principal was Frankie Anderson. And so Ms. Carbon had a, a history program for the school. And it was like a mock radio program. And I was to say Emancipation Proclamation. I cannot say Emancipation Proclamation to save my life. And ever since th that program ended in May in fifth grade, I've been saying Emancipation Proclamation and trying to find out more about mm -hmm. um, Lincoln uh, freeing those enslaved in the 11 uh, Confederate states, uh, studying the um, uh, Reconstruction area. My freshman year, I was at Spelman College and I was in 
Dr. Lynn's um, special history class, and we discovered and explored that era more. So it was just that trajectory. And then I went to Texas Southern University. Then you have all this great artwork by uh, Dr. John Biggers, who started the uh, art department there. And you have these murals that his students did. So, you know, I'm in this great H at HBCU, this great environment, this stimulating environment. So I, I just think all of that influenced me. Okay. Um, did you have any courses in that uh, black literature or black history while you were in high school? I didn't in high school, but my English teacher did have a book club. I didn't get into black literature until I was in college. And I do remember, I think my junior year, we had a lot of options to read. So of course I read uh, Richard Wright's Black Boy, mm -hmm. uh, The Fire Next Time probably uh, Native Son and, and, and possibly Ellison's uh, Invisible Man. So that was my really my introduction into it. Mm -hmm. And then my first job after graduation was in a preschool in Houston in 1966. And that's when I discovered Ezra Jack Keats who wrote all these books about Peter, this black boy, Peter's chair, Whistle for Willie, Snowy Day, Goggles, High Cat, Pet Show. And I was just so glad to see a black book a book featuring a black child as the central figure and in such a positive light. And so as a consequence of uh, that experience, I started collecting uh, Ezra Jack Keats books in uh, uh, building a library for my future children. So, um, and then when my son, Derek, he says, I never say his name. <laughs> so when it was my son's uh, ninth birthday party. I decided to go buy books for party favors. And at the time I was working at the Visiting Nurse Association, which is on Greenville Avenue at that time near North Park Shopping Center. And North Park had like four bookstores, Walden and then uh, Titus. Now Dillard's had a book department in it. And I can't recall the names of the other bookstores, but I had to go to four bookstores to come up with 10 books as party favors. And I wanted to give books as party favors instead of the traditional things that the kids probably have broken before they left the house. So I was fit to be tied. And as a consequence, uh, that's how Black Images got launched. She and I met in graduate school at the University of Texas Graduate School of Social Work. And um, our program was a two year program and we knew we wanted to do something together. Uh, so it was a book she was a she would go to the social work meetings and come back with books and what have you so we launched black images in um, 1977 at the national association of black social workers meeting here in dallas we were you know table vendors and uh we started off as mail order then we moved to the flea market in winwood and then we opened full-time in 86 and then we were at 142 and then we moved to 230 Winwood Village Shopping Center in 1992. So uh, we just rocked and roll after that. Okay. You uh, mentioned in the bio that you sent me that uh, you were influenced by Alice Walker and Stoughton Lynn and some of the people you met at uh, Stoughton. Right. Right. Well, and Alice Walker was my RA. I don't think we called him that at the time, but she was the resident advisor and she was influenced by Dr. Howard Zinn and then Dr. Lynn and Zinn was over the history department and Lynn worked in that department. And so um, Lynn, I think, was having a pilot um, history type class. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we um, studied more in depth about the Civil War and the Reconstruction era. Okay. I observed Alice and you know, she was just really, really focused and what have you. Did you take anything from Howard Zinn? Uh, as you know, he's a very famous historian. Right, I did not have any uh, classes from him, but you know, I read about him and do you know that Dr. Manley, who was the first African-American president of Spelman College and he was president when I went there, he had the, uh, he fired Zen because he said that Zen was trying to radicalize the students. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting. And I do follow the, uh, there's a, a bookstore in DC that puts out literature about the Zen project and what have you. So I do follow that, but no, I did not have any classes from Zen, just Dr. Lin and his department. And Dr. Lin was a conscientious objector, um, a political activist and what have you. And again, you were involved in the civil rights movement while you were there. 
Yes, a, 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 as a fresh right. I lived in Packard Hall, and that hall had uh, all classification of students. And Ruby Dara Smith was one of the students there, and she uh, was very active in the civil rights movement. She would be at school, and then she'd go away, uh, involved in protests uh, in Atlanta and in other cities. And so she would come back, and we would play bid whisk up in the lounge and what have you. But she was just real. Uh, influencing. So then with protests, um, they would ask us to march. And uh, so I was in the group that was called Hit and Runs. My daughter should have said it should have been Sit and Run. But he, I mean, I was Sit and Run. My daughter said it should have been Hit and Run. And the um, strategy was that if we would go to a restaurant or a diner and sit there and ask to be served, um, and they wouldn't ignore us or not serve us, but we would stay there. But if they asked us to leave in the presence of the police, we would leave. And so, uh, you know, it's like in all warfare, all strategy, you know, you have those who do different things. And Ruby Doris was one of those who uh, was in the group that went to jail. But we went to different ones and uh, had different um, protests. But Ruby Doris later became the first president of the executive director of SNCC. And so she's really one of my unsung heroes. And if I ever have time, I'd like to do some more research and write a book about Ruby Doris Smith. I talk anytime anybody interviews me about civil rights or anything, I always bring up Ruby Doris Smith. What was the difference between Spelman and Texas Southern? It froze. Oh, I, I, I asked the question, what was the difference between Spelman and Texas Southern? Well, you know, when you're a student going off, you're not always as focused and you want to party a little bit. And there were too many restrictions there. Although my sophomore year, I was selected to live in the dormitory that didn't have house mothers. And I just had more freedom at home. Um, I It was... Um, I think basically the same. The curriculum at HBCUs are very good. It was just that during that era, 1962, 63, a little more restrictions on me that I wanted to have. And you know, I had more freedom at home, so I came back home. Did you take black literature or black history at Texas Southern? You know, I didn't. It was just in the literature classes that I became connected with it. And then, I, like I said, the presence of Dr. Biggers on campus and seeing all those murals that his students did on campus, you know, just was just an influence. Okay. Uh, I, I always wondered, uh, when you were selling books all over the Metroplex, did you have a full-time job? I did. I was the vice president of the long-term care division at the Visiting Nurse Association. And so um, the good thing about being in Dallas, all of these conferences were coming here, the NAACP, the, uh, the National Medical Association, um, the National Library Association, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. So um, there did come a time when the executive director did call me in and uh, uh, there were some issues, but, you know, I worked them out. And then later on, uh, I took advantage of an opportunity to, to leave in 1985. Um, I left in, um, after Thanksgiving of November 1985. Was that because you were doing so well selling books? that it was Well, I needed to devote more attention to it. Uh, we had developed a customer base. Okay. So, and then we could move into, we had the flea market. So it was at the point that we needed to move into full-time retail and we had grown the business uh, gradually and uh, built up our base, built up our uh, books, met with vendors, met with bookseller representative. I can remember meeting with a uh, random house representative, Rick Cox at the Lancaster Keys library, now Paul Lawrence Nunn bar library. Uh, so I would meet them in public places and then finally um, got into the full-time retail. Did you have any competitors in Dallas at the time? At the time, no, we were the very first uh, black bookstore. Um, and then we grew the business so well that uh, Walmart and all these other stores started, uh, these big box stores started carrying uh, a great, more, a more extensive line. We had an extensive line of, of uh, 
books in all areas, just not fiction or nonfiction. They're not just the popular things that you're familiar with, like Maya Angelou or um, B.B. Moore Campbell. We had history. We had books from the African diaspora. I'm trying, I'm visualizing how everything's arranged in the store. Uh, the art books, uh, we carried every category, you, metaphysics, everything you could think about. We had in a very extensive children's uh, collection. Do you remember the year when we had sort of like a black literary conference here? We brought in uh, Margaret Walker Alexander, Terry McMillan, um, who else? But anyway. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Harry, Harry, uh, Harry Robinson had that. And in fact, I picked him up from the airport. Uh, it was um, Terry McMillan, Sonia Sanchez, right, right. and uh, someone else. Oh, I can't think of her name right now. So, um, and I picked him up from the airport and it was hosted at the Dallas Public Library. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I do recall when Margaret Ale Walker Alexander did come in previously. Uh, but anyway, that was a, a good conference. Okay. How did that help your business? Well, of course, we were able to um, acquaint people more with Terry McMillan. She hadn't quite blown up at that time. And then to introduce people to Sonia Sanchez and her, her uh, poetry, um, her delivery of poetry. Mm -hmm. And um, it just brought, because they were, uh, came to town. More people, this was an opportunity for more people to know about uh, Black images. Okay. Who had not patronized us before. When did you start that book club that I was the only male member of? Oh, uh, that was, a, um, uh, it was called Midnight Birds. Okay. Uh, we started it in the 80s. Uh, I would say about 83. Okay. When did you go off to work on your degree? When did you um, work? No. I started finishing it up in 83. And I okay, okay. So it was about 82, 83. And first it was just a group of us getting together. We wanted, to, we enjoyed reading. And then we read uh, Midnight Birds, a collection of short stories um, uh, edited by Mary Helen Washington. And there was one story in there that just grabbed us. And so we decided to call ourselves Midnight Birds. And then, you know, the, we also went over to Lincoln High School to record some sessions and you were a part of that and you had Malik there, uh, your son Malik. And so um, that was a good experience. We would go from different homes to meet, but then we recorded sessions to put on cable TV or something. I forget what it was called, but we had access to uh, sharing that video medium. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember the third eye? And what was your relationship with them? Because indeed they, put, they were pushing books well, I was one of the founding members of the Third Eye, and it was a group of enlightenment. And our first conference was over at um, Bishop College then. I don't know if it was Paul Quinn then. but And we brought in uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Naeem Akbar, and just a whole lot of other uh, uh, scholarly people about who have information about the Afrocentric uh, diaspora. And... Uh, it was well attended and it, it repeated. So I was very pleased to be a part of that uh, organization. Um, you seem to have had some of everything in your bookstore. Um, what did you see sort of selling the most in terms of black literature in the eighties and nineties, by the way? Well, we sold, well, I like fiction. So we sold a lot of fiction, but I made a mistake. Initially, I did not carry Iceberg Slim and Donald Goins because, you know, I, you know, I thought it was mm, literature. So anyway, one people would come to the door and they would ask if I had Iceberg Slim or Donald Goins. I said, no, they would just go on back. But one day a lady came who asked for it and she liked Toni Morrison. And after that, it was on because I, I liked Toni Morrison. And then um, I would. Uh, guide people to move into mysteries. You know, uh, a lot of people didn't like mystery. And then, of course, romance. Now, um, we had a big romance section. And Francis, the late Francis Ray, who was a pediatric nurse here in the Dallas Independent School District, uh, came to me with her book. It was published by Odyssey, which was a small press. And they, were, they had like three books. And so then the romance writers were coming here one year. 
And they were going to like Romance Writers of America in Fort Worth or something like that. But they never had any attention. The people would come by and smile at them and pass it, pass, speak to them, but they never would buy a book. So we launched the Romance Slam Jam. We had an event here. And um, this was in 1995 or 96, I think. And so uh, the authors, uh, Donna Hill, Gwen Forrester, they just said, oh, this was just so wonderful because their authors, their fans came in. We believe in marrying readers with fans. And then we had it again. There was another big literary event that was going to be at the Anatole in Dallas. So we had that event. And some people caught the bus and the train to come here from Oklahoma and Louisiana because they really wanted to see the authors. And the reason why we did this with the Romance Slam Jam is well, we start, we call it the Romance Slam Jam, is because the uh, they were published by uh, Harlequin and what have you, but they weren't putting any money behind them to market and promote them. So that's what we did. And then one year we took a cruise uh, to uh, St. Thomas, and there we arranged to have a literary event there. We uh, were able to this is back in the day. <laughs> we were able to arrange for a camera crew to come on board our ship and interview the authors. We were arranged, We went to a radio station there in St. Thomas and our authors were interviewed on uh, the radio. We had, and then we had an event at some center there uh, with our authors and their authors. And then the, we were covered by the media. So it was just really a good ex experience. And since then, we would have it every year. And then in 2000, the Romance Slam Jam moved to uh, 2001, because we had the la we had 2000 here. That's when we moved to the hotel to host it, because heretofore we were always hosting it at Black Images. And then in 2001, it went to Orlando. Uh, Brenda Jackson, who is a um, very famous romance writer, uh, Brenda Woodbury was a great who uh, loved romance books, was a reader, mm -hmm. and um, Jackie from Mom Show Books, but when we were here in 2000, Brenda Woodbury, the advocate, she had just lost her husband. She really got into romance. She said, Emma, I can take this to Orlando. And when we went to Orlando, it was just magnificent. They had a signature bottle of wine. Uh, what's his name? Shaq O'Neal's mother was one of the sponsors. I mean, they had all kind of sponsorship. So it was a good event. And so they, they were meeting, planning for the meeting. They said, you know what? We need to have an award. And they all said at the same time, let's call it the Emma Award because of my commitment to, uh, to the uh, authors. So they have several categories for uh, paranormal, uh, multicultural, um, just all kind of characters, romantic suspense, yeah. erotic, you name it. Yeah. Two questions come out of the, what you just said. One, uh, your support for local writers. And two, uh, your ability to keep pace with the trends, trends in African-American literature. So how much did you support uh, local uh, writers and authors? Oh, let me tell you what, I love emerging authors, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have great talent, but if people don't know about it, uh, it will just be great talent, a great book that will sit on maybe 100 bookshelves. So we did a lot, like Kamika Spencer is a writer here. And she's also a playwright, and I really want her to do um, the play uh, Blind Seven. But then anyway, we had Kamika Spencer and uh, Victor McLaughlin, uh, just, oh, somebody who was moderated a conference yesterday, um, Rosalind Story. Mm -hmm. And with her book, she did uh, African American women of African American divas of opera and concert. Mm -hmm. And so when we had that event, um, New Art Six came in, and this is an acapella group. Yeah. And then Rosalind was there, and so that was nice. Um, uh, then Jay California Cooper moved to Texas. Uh, she had a small book that was published by Alice Walker's Publishing Company, but she moved to Texas to, because the cost of living was cheaper here. And um, her first book was A Peace of Mind, and I love that I hand sold that book. And then I had a girlfriend who worked for Doubleday as a rep, and she said, Emma, I want to take this to Doubleday, and she did. Uh, and then uh, Victoria Christopher Murray wrote this book called 
I can't think of it. But anyway, she called a bookstore and she's not from Texas, but it, she self-published. Mm-hmm. And she um, called a bookstore in uh, Arkansas, Pyramid Bookstore. And so she said, I'm calling and I'm promoting my book, Temptation. That's the name of it. She said, and I'm promoting my book, Temptation. And so Garbo said, oh, yes, I know. And she said, well, how do you know? And I had told Garbo that this was a great book and she should get it. So I really like hand selling really good literature. Okay. Uh, again, the second question then was, given all the genres of black literature, you know, from the romance to history to Afrocentric books, uh, how did you keep uh, abreast of all those those trends in, in in black literature? Well, one thing, the trade reps, because we got uh, the, the trade reps from the different publishing houses would come. And then I would attend the American Booksellers Association. And then I affiliated with the local, it was called the Southwestern Booksellers Association when I first started. And in fact, Ntozaki Shange, who wrote the uh, For Colored Girls, mm-hmm. was uh, the author that was presented there. So I think the trade reps uh, going to meetings, and I'll never forget one time we had Derek Bell and he said, um, he told me about Jill Nelson's book, Volunteer Slavery. Mm-hmm. So when I saw it in the catalog, I immediately ordered it, had Jill and uh, come several times and for all of her books. So uh, just looking through the catalogs, tearing out the pages, you know, with the black section and then friends. I had uh, people who would go to conferences and come back and say, oh, you got to have this book. I was at the National mm-hmm. uh, Black. What is it they have in September? The Black... Um, Congressional Black Caucus thing they have in September every year. And this author was there. So, you know, word of mouth and word of mouth, the reps, and then reading, listening to the radio and what have you. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some of your preferences. You, 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 you gave me a list of all your favorite authors. And I said, well, wait a minute. Um, who's the favorite? Right. Well, it's like having children. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have two, so you know, I, I have more, but of course, Toni Morrison heads the list, hands mm-hmm. down. I love her um, Song of Solomon. And then I took this class at the Dallas Institute and they, on the bluest eye. So now it's between the Song of Solomon and the bluest eye. But uh, Toni Morrison heads down, and then Derek Bell's, his face is at the bottom of the well. When that book came out, customers I knew, well, I wouldn't let them leave the store unless they bought it. And then I said, I guarantee you this. And, and then Jay California Cooper's book, one of her books, I told him, I said, you've got to have this. I said, uh, I'll refund you your money if you don't like it. So nobody ever took me up on it. So, you know, those are some of my favorites. Yeah. What has sold the most uh, over the years? Uh, well, well, while you were running the bookstore, what type of literature, Black literature sold the most? Okay. Well, Fiction, you have your romance, but then over in your history, you have like Ivan Van Serdema, Stolen Legacy, Destruction of Black Civilization, Miseducation of the Negro, uh, Dr. Ben Yakinin's, all of his books. So uh, that, you know, you, you have people who were focused on d- just different things. So, you know, you, you got to know your customers. So when they would come in, you would recommend something. And then it would be like, at a particular time, everybody would, want to come out and read horror, you know, like, um, what's her name? Uh, Tanana Reeve Do, and, what, and we've had her here, uh, and other horror writers. It was just like, it would just be all at one time, they would all appear to, you know, want to buy those books. So just a little bit of everything, but mostly fiction, because, you know, that's what I like. Uh, and then the history, I also like history. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, the children's literature, I'm thinking, of, you know, I'm imagining how the story is arranged right now, to, you know, to come up uh, to reply. So just a little bit of everything, but mainly your fiction, your nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Oh, your autobiographies, of course. We had Patti LaBelle. Um, we had Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight. Um, we had Johnny Cochran, James Earl Jones. So, you know, all those people you know, drove a lot of business to the store. And then E. Lynn Harris, we had a, uh, who writes fiction, we had a lot of uh, people come out for him. Did, didn't he come here uh, to your store, E. Lynn Harris? Oh, several times. Okay. And in fact, in one of his books, I am the mother. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm the central character's mother. So he was really good. And other authors have been really good about... Um, in their dedication, 
Mm -hmm. uh, dedicating books to us and what have you. In fact, Bertice Berry did that with her redemption song. Uh, uh, she dedicated it to me and other um, booksellers, even though my name is, the D is left out of my name, but anyway. <laughs> but it's set in black images and she would go all over. Let me tell you, I got calls from people in Australia, the UK, all over the US. I don't know, they love that book because there was uh, two, a man and woman came in in search of this book and uh, it was something inspiring about it. So, I mean, I got calls all the time from people all over the world about Redemption Song. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, out of all the things that he sold, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, what were your customers like? Um, who, who came to your store? Was it working class people? Scholars? Everybody. And I can remember, I had uh, one lady came in who was a principal. She said, it's spring break. I don't want to think. Just give me a book. So she would, I, I give her a romance book and even a turn that said, I don't want to think. Mm -hmm. And then you had those who were really focused. I remember one man, in fact, he named, I in the course of Black Images, I had a baby, Candace, who is now 33. But anyway, he, he named her. He because I had the black business, he gave her the name of Candace so that she could go with Candace, which is the African pronunciation or the Western pronunciation. But anyway, and he was real intense and he didn't have a car. Uh, and, uh, but he was really focused on the history literature and uh, Ivan Van Sertimer, uh Chancellor Williams type literature. Then we had, um, just everybody, people, people like art, people like architecture, when architecture books would come out. Um, just so, just think of the bell shaped curve and everybody came in, okay? Right, right, right. Uh, didn't you do a book uh, signing with Jim Schutze for the accommodation? Yes, and that came out in 87 because I was pregnant. Came right. out in February of 87. And so he, the book was going to be published by Taylor Publishing and mm -hmm. Taylor Publishing here published uh, school book uh, albums. And uh, when he was going and then some new people bought it. Mm -hmm. So the, the powers that be or the mafia or whoever came and told me, they said, if you publish this book, you will never publish another book. So Accommodation was published by Lyle Stewart Publishing in Secaucus, New Jersey. And that was February of 87. And we sold like over 200 books and it, it continued to sell after that. Uh, it was a very successful signing. One of the things you talked about in your bio was, um, well, you talked about the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the black arts movement. And so I, I guess I wanna look historically um, what would you say Black literature evolved into after the Black arts movement? Okay. Maybe, in fact, I, I think you perhaps need to, um, for our listeners, talk about what the Harlem Renaissance was. And of course, the, I guess I'm getting too scholarly here, perhaps. And of course, the Black arts movement. And then what happened uh, after those two? very important uh, literary movements among African-Americans. Well, the Harlem Renaissance was a period when, uh, in Harlem, Harlem is located in New York. You know, everybody doesn't know that. Okay, a community in New York and blacks moved there and it was just a thriving community of everybody, but you had people, artists like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, uh, just a number of people and they supported each other, but they also were activists. You can tell that in uh, Langston Hughes work. And uh, let me digress. And one of the play I really like is Langston Hughes. Are you, are you, or have you ever been? And that's when he was going to be called up before the uh, Senate hearing committee about being a communist. But anyway, and then you had the black art well, and that was during the 20s, like the 1920s to just before the fall in 1929, before the Depression. But it was thriving. We had dancers, uh, artists, um, 
people who worked in the eight theatrical productions. Just you just think of the entire and uh, you think of the t entire art scene and you had those people. So they were supporting each other and encouraging each other. And then the black arts movement, which came along later, you had people like uh, Amiri Baraka, Sonia Sanchez and uh, Nikki Giovanni grew out of that and others. And they were um, progressive in terms of being more active and demanding uh wanting more uh, equality and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and then since that time, um, you see it, you know, like in some of the, oh, like in some of the literature now, like um, Claudia Rankin's Citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that continuing in, and in terms of what's happening in our nation now, you see more that that black arts movement, the, uh, the, uh, the authors writing with that same uh, trajectory because of what's happening at the uh, trying to disenfranchise us mm -hmm. and African-Americans and trying to um, just, just not include us and that there's no equality, diversion and inclusion, even though, you know, that's the, the buzzwords, but uh, addressing those issues and demanding those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a question in the, from the chat. And uh, the question I want to know, would you repeat the list of the first four books you read by Black authors? Okay, yes. It would be Black Boy and Native Son by Richard Wright, mm -hmm. The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, and Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And I hope that answers the question. Uh, let's see. Could, there's also a question in the chat that said, could we see a return of Black images online? <laughs> that book has been closed. That chapter has been closed. Okay. But I'd be happy to refer you to my bookstore I go to, which is two miles away from my house, Pan-African Book Connection. Yes, yes. In fact, let's talk about why you closed, uh, why you and Ashura closed Black Images, I guess, in, the 90, in uh, 2006. Right, right. And you know what, if I've been thinking, I would just kept it over one more month, 2000, and to make it January 2007, because that would have made us be an operational for exactly 30 years, even though we did continue a little bit. Mm -hmm. But on the in the literature, it says 2006. It's because um, the, like, Barnes and Nobles and Walmart started carrying the literature and it was, you know, two or four dollars cheaper. And I'll never forget one uh, student came in. We carried a number of the books that students needed at community colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is when gas was high. And he came in. And he said uh, he asked for this book. It was like 14 dollars. I can't remember the title. And he said, um, well, you mind if I go to Barnes and Nobles? And I said, you got gas. And he turned around and bought it. Okay, but it was because of that mentality. I can buy for, I can use wear and tear on my car to go to Barnes and Nobles in the suburbs mm -hmm. to buy a book that was two, four dollars. And sometimes the books were at the cost we bought them because in the book industry is sixty forty. So I pay forty percent for the book. So my prop, I mean sixty percent of the book. So you know they could buy them at that actual cost. And so um, it was an economics thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rosalind Story, who's with us, asks, what are you doing now to stay connected to books and book events? Well, uh, and uh, thank you, Sandaria, for having this uh, Dallas Literary Festival. I was on all day yesterday, and I'm going to be on all day today, um, reading the newspaper, uh, listening to NPR. I'm an NPR junkie, uh, and I'm in three book clubs. Um, and uh, Black Pearl's Keeping It Real. I moderate a book club for Methodist uh, Charlton that I've been doing since 2008, I think. So we do it. We have a monthly book club and we review books every month. And then I'm in a, oh, in a multicultural uh, book club with Anne Fields, who got me in that particular uh, book club. So I'm in three book clubs. I'm supposed to be in some others, but I just can't fit it in. So, um, and you know, sharing with friends, you know, we enjoy sharing books. 
Okay. Uh, that, of course, relates to a question I want to ask you about uh, the Dallas Civil Rights Museum and how that relates to your passion for books. Well, uh, we started that in 20... Museum. We started that in 2014. And when Patrick Jackson and Lois Lilly came to me with the idea, I said, I can't believe I'm doing this. But anyway, we started it and uh, we have a lot of artifacts that people have donated. Um, and things that we had, Lois and I have tons of books and we really do have a lot of books in there. And so we have, uh, we feel like it's a museum but we have to tell you about what happened in history. And we say our museum is like your dress rehearsal before you go to the National Museum in uh, Washington DC. But we have events, uh, for example, in 2015 uh, because of all of the uh, murders of uh, black men and women we had a panel about that and Marvin, you were gracious enough to organize that for us uh, because that was the, I think the 55th observance of the murder of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we plan to do that again this year, hopefully. Um, but just to, we have the books there to, to tell the, to complement and tell the history, to complement the photos that we have in there of uh, Emmett Till. And I always like to start with that wall, the wall of remembrance. And I have people remember three dates. Emmett Till was uh, kidnapped and murdered on August uh, 28th, 1955. Uh, the March on Washington for um, uh, jobs and, um, what, jobs and freedom was on August 28th. 1963, and then the then Senator Barack Obama uh, got the nomination to be the Democratic candidate for President of the United States on August 28, 2008. So I always like to start with that, and then we take them down the wall and talk about the um, Little Rock Nine, and then talk about um, how those students how Arbel Farvis, who was the governor of Oklahoma, of, of Arkansas, closed the school down for one year rather than have the students go there. And then part of Brown v. Board uh, was the uh, Prince uh, George's County, and they closed the schools down for five years. And so now when I think of what's happening with our children and this virtual learning at home, I think about, um, uh, you know, you're going to have a loss of learning, in, you know, as a consequence of that. So... Those are just some of the things that um, we have in the Civil Rights Museum. But but this thing about education and kids losing out of school and not going to school is uh, makes me think about you know what happened during Brown v. Board in, in, with Prince George's County and they and they didn't they closed the schools for five years rather than have students to go uh, to school the black students to go to school with the white students and then they used the tax money uh, of black people to start. Um, these private schools, these uh, they use governmental money to do that. Yes. All right. Uh, I just been informed we have three minutes left, and uh, I'd like for you to wrap up by telling us was it worth it, Emma? Uh, all this work you did selling books uh, for over thirty. Absolutely, years. it was. And and Marvin, I'm still buying books. My husband said there are too many books in this house. <laughs> and a long time ago, there was a bookstore on. Uh, on Preston, I think, called House of Books. And so I managed to buy books and, and, and bring them here. And it's just good to connect with people, uh, to, you know, to introduce them to books, to introduce them to a whole world. You know what? And for the longest, I, we did not carry books on audio books. And I had one customer said, you know, when I was school, I was fooling around and I didn't take it seriously. So I really need the audible books. And so, you know, that uh, that was good. It, it's good. And then I meet I see grown children. I was at the one native craft community center, you know, yeah. before I COVID and one man said, my mother used to bring us in there and we got books for it when we got our report card. So, you know, that's really good to have that kind of influence yes. and, um, you know, keep a generation of reading being engaged. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Emma. And I'll turn it back over to Sandra Smith. Thank you, Dr. Delaney and Mrs. Emma Rogers. That was amazing. Thank you, Ms. Rogers, for being such an icon in the Dallas community and throughout the U.S. And I, uh, this is my first time having the opportunity to listen to your story. 
I wish we had two hours. That would have been great. Uh, I can listen, continue to listen, but thank you all. Our next event that's coming up for the Dallas Literary Festival is with, uh, sorry, we're gonna be talking about food on one event and the other event is how to be an adult. So the first event, one event is with Chef Alexander Smalls and uh, Adrian Miller. They use cookbooks to uh, talk about history. And then the other book is with uh, with Lori, Laura Harris of Channel 5 News is gonna be in conversation with uh, the author of How to Be an Adult. So both of those are gonna be great. I'll be checking in and out of every one of them. And please go over to our uh, bookstores, list independent bookstores and purchase these wonderful books. Larry, did you have anything before we leave? I'm like you. I just could listen forever. And thank you so much, Dr. Delaney and Emma. It was wonderful. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you, Larry, for the nice, fine introduction. And thank you, Marvin. All right. Thank thank you all. You. And don't forget the African American Museum. I see that in behind you, <laughs> where we hold Tula Soma. I was a big advocate for Tula Soma for a long time. So, and still share in those events over there, Tula Soma Book Fair. Thank you, Dr. Delaney. Uh, my pleasure. Yes. Thank you. All right.